Around the world, millions of people are reported missing every year, and while most of these are solved and in a timely manner, for others this is not the case at all. Some of these disappearances happen under bizarre circumstances and are less clear. Let's begin with the disappearance from the UK, or within England specifically. If you're familiar with my coverage of Gaia Pope, linked above and in the description, who disappeared from Swanage in 2017. While many years prior, this one occurred around 30 miles to the north in Salisbury. This happened to John Johnson, who was three years old on the 21st of June, 1955. On that particular day, John and some members of his family were holidaying together and camping, which is something their family seemed to love doing in the English countryside. John, as far as I can tell, was the youngest person there, and his sister and cousin went on a walk that day to head to the shops which were about a mile away from camp. On the way to the shop, the two girls were playing with John, and as they got closer, they had what was supposed to be a playful race to the finishing line. This, as it turns out, was not a good idea, as when they turned around to check on John, he'd vanished. This seemed to have confused the girls at first, because there wasn't really anywhere for John to have gone, as it appears that they were all heading in a mostly straight line on one trail. They shouted for him, and searched for him, but they couldn't find him. And from what I can tell, this seems to have led to suspicions that John might have been taken, even though they hadn't seen anyone at all. This was reported two days into the search. There was still no trace early today of John Johnson missing on Salisbury Plain since Tuesday afternoon. Police and troops resumed the search again at 6am. In yesterday's search, called off at dusk, 600 men from the Highland Light Infantry and 100 police were aided by helicopters, army spotting planes and dogs. After the race, the boy has not been seen since. Today, police at Salisbury discussed the suggestion that an undergarment found yesterday belonged to the boy. They believe that the boy has wandered a long distance or has gone into hiding and is too frightened to move. This piece of clothing turned out to have nothing to do with John. Now, John was found, but it wasn't without its peculiarities. The sunburnt John Johnson toddled out of a field near the Hampshire-Wiltshire border shortly before 8am today. He was restored to his mother, appearing well and not unduly concerned. Not unduly concerned, yet he had been lost for three nights and two days on rugged Salisbury Plain. He had wandered four or five miles away through rough country and over the top of Beacon Hill, one of the highest points on the plain to Park House. This was something that surprised the searchers because they didn't know how he'd managed such a steep climb all by himself. But unfortunately, that was given short shrift, which tends to happen when people are just happy that the lost are found safe and sound. I feel that it may have been worth a little more discussion though, and I'm sure there probably were discussions that took place behind closed doors because it could indicate that there may have been involvement from another person. In any case, after being found, officers asked him how he'd spent the last three days, but he unfortunately wasn't able to delve into specifics. But what he did have to say was quite odd. He said that he'd met another boy who hit him, that he slept in a tree, and the articles all phrase this next part differently. Some simply say that, quote, he muttered something about a dog and a horse. Others say that he played with the dog and horse, and one stated that he was talking with the dog and horse. Nothing more could be found about this boy he spoke of, and it's hard to imagine what was going on there. He met another boy in the middle of nowhere? Was he hallucinating these events? It's not really clear. But one way or another, he sure seemed to manage and finish a very unlikely journey. Any hope of getting Johnny's story from him was quickly dashed. He was tired, hungry and thirsty, and could say nothing of his adventures beyond a few disjointed phrases. I slept in a tree, a boy hit me, was all he said beyond muttering something about a dog. His clothes were in a shocking state, dirty and torn to pieces. 
His body was all reddened, looking like exposure to the sun. But all else we could see wrong with him were a few scratches on his legs and head. Those are basically the final words on John's disappearance. I suppose the main thing was that he was found, but I'd sure like to hear more about this other boy, and perhaps how he spent the nights. And actually, frankly, how he disappeared so quickly. In any case, given that's the end of the paper trail, let's explore the next disappearance. Tyler Wright was 35 years old when he disappeared from the Boise Creek Trail in Unk, British Columbia, Canada, on the 10th of August, 2010. At the time, Tyler was on a five-day solo hike that would take him through the Coquitlam and Indian Arm area. Unfortunately though, Tyler seemed to have made a pretty big mistake right off the bat. The earliest articles take us to around a week into the official search effort. Squamish Royal Canadian Mounted Police say the 35-year-old is not an experienced mountain hiker and did not take a sleeping bag, tent or compass with him into the woods. He was wearing running shoes when he was dropped off at Boise Creek Trail near Squamish on the 10th of August. It's not really clear to me why he made that decision, perhaps he just intended to sleep rough. I have no idea, but that's certainly not something that should be recommended. Tyler was a very strong and big guy standing at 6 foot 4. He was said to be competent in the outdoors and could look after himself well enough. He did take food packs and water with him, and when he was reported missing 8 days later by his family, the authorities thought he could last for as long as a month out in this area with the provisions he had. The search for Tyler entered its 8th day on Wednesday, after crews discovered more evidence that the missing hiker could still be alive. Searchers are now concentrating on an area called Bull Creek near Squamish, BC, a day after crews located a 15 metre long slide path down a rock face. They think Tyler tried to climb up out of the creek bed, but slid back down instead. While this was suspected as evidence of Tyler's recent presence, they went completely sure up until they found the next clue. Size 16 footprints believed to be Tyler's were found in the creek bed near the slide area, confirming for rescuers that he continued on from there. Tyler wore a very large shoe size, making his prints fairly unique, and there was nothing else that the searchers believed could have left them. So with that, they now had a strong lead and a focal point to direct the search to. The distinctively large impressions were first found along the Boise Creek Trail near the Bull Bowl last week, and more prints were found Monday afternoon. Searchers are now working the Valley Creek bed where they found the impressions, but have described the terrain as heinous and difficult to traverse. These footprints, while already difficult to follow because of the hazardous area, they would come to peter out and they just couldn't be followed any further and the trail was lost. Search dogs trailed this area up and down, but they could never establish a scent for some reason, and unfortunately, that wasn't expanded upon. Not far from the end of the footprint trail, they found a patch of flattened vegetation, which likely means that Tyler had been laying down right there. It's unlikely that this was just a fall into that spot, as that wouldn't flatten it to the degree that it was. Instead, it highlights that Tyler had been there for a while, though we'll never fully know why. The likelihood is that he was sleeping there, or he may have been hiding from an animal. I believe that bears are active in this area, though there was no evidence at all of animal predation, so it's unlikely, as bears aren't known to be discreet and any evidence left behind by such an event would have been completely clear to the searchers. To add to the search effort, there were helicopters in the air using thermal imaging technology, including one that the family had rented privately with high resolution cameras. From what I can tell, all footage of this was uploaded to a blog run by the family in the hopes that someone might spot something in the footage that had been missed. But despite over 12,000 people being involved in that effort, it just seems that the footprints led nowhere and he vanished after that. The search reached its end after 12 days didn't provide any further evidence of Tyler's presence. 
One of the largest ground searches ever conducted in British Columbia has been suspended after 12 days of searching failed to find any trace of a missing hiker who set off alone into the rugged mountains north of Vancouver. Search teams logged 5,000 hours covering 200 square kilometers of rugged mountain terrain without success. Because of the slide patch, the footprints and the evidence of laying down or sleeping in the area, officers made it clear that they fully believed that they were on the right track, but were surprised when they couldn't locate anything further. Corporal Dave Ritchie added, It's a mountain hike, but I don't think it's established all the way through. It shows it's connected to both ends of a trail, but we're not really sure if it is. I don't know if he got into something more than he thought he was going into. That's very interesting, and perhaps I'm taking it the wrong way here, but from what I can tell, he's essentially saying that this trail might not be fully mapped, or correctly mapped at least. That wasn't expanded upon, but you'd think that the search effort would reveal the answer to that in the end. But one way or another, Tyler, nor any trace of him after the footprints, was ever found. Boots on the ground, nor the search dogs, or the thermal imaging cameras could provide any further answers. We're almost 12 years from the date of the disappearance, and nothing has ever turned up. So what happened to Tyler, and where did he go? On the 25th of January, 2002, 20-year-old Chris Carlton Tompkins left his home in Ellerslie, Georgia to head to work. After arriving, he parked his car and then drove to the work site with a surveyor that he was employed by. Chris was part of a four-man survey crew in a wooded area near County Line Road, off of Warm Springs Road in Harris County. At the time this occurred, Chris was working alongside three other co-workers who were approximately 50 feet apart walking in one direction. Around 1pm, Chris was last seen by one of his co-workers who said that he'd looked away for a moment and when he looked back, Chris was gone. Around 1pm, the surveyor informed his wife that Chris had gone missing, but it wasn't until 4.15pm that Chris's mother was notified. The family reported this to the authorities, but were told that they had to wait 24 hours before filing the missing persons report. Hour after hour, without assistance from law enforcement, they combed the area where Chris was supposedly last seen. What we found was puzzling, and did not make sense in light of what Chris's co-workers told authorities, the mother said. We found one of his boots, his work tools, a blue fibre from his pants, and 12 cents on the ground near the items. Interestingly, it was his family that seems to have made this find but most articles insinuate that it was the co-workers and authorities who found them. This fibre was snagged on a barbed wire fence, I believe. The following day, which was the 26th of January, the local sheriff's department launched the official search. Despite an extensive search, no other evidence was found, and Chris wasn't located, which would eventually bring the effort to a close. Five months after Chris went missing, his second boot was found in a different location. Some state that it was on a private property, around 900 yards from the initial disappearance point, while others place it on private property located miles north of Interstate 85. From what I understand, I believe the correct location was 900 yards away. Prior to his disappearance, Chris's boss reported that he exhibited peculiar behaviour, but Chris's mother vehemently denied these allegations stating that she saw him daily and never observed this kind of behaviour or distress or anything of that nature. This disappearance was very strange. What made Chris leave that day and what happened to him? One puzzling question that must be asked is why had Chris removed his boots and why were coins found near to where he was last seen? If he was forcibly taken from the area, as many seem to believe, why did his co-workers not hear a commotion or a shout? There is no evidence to suggest the presence of foul play, but that leaves us with an odd set of circumstances and no real answers. Could Chris have felt threatened or spooked in that moment and then bolted from the area? Work boots don't just fall off. He may, for whatever reason, have felt that he had to get out of there fast, and then got snagged on the barbed wire where he also removed his boots to run faster, but only managed to remove one and then remove the other when he had a moment. 
That's speculation, of course, but it's very difficult to imagine a scenario that makes sense to explain the removal of his shoes. The discovery of the second boot raises even more questions than it answers, because the speculative scenario I just laid out could be completely wrong, which would raise questions such as whether the boot was moved after the fact or if Chris had literally been right there. As the investigation into the disappearance continued, several theories were put forwards. As said, some people believed that he had been attacked. Others believed that Chris may have stumbled upon something that he shouldn't have seen while working with the survey crew, and whomever he observed was responsible. Another theory was that Chris had wandered off into the woods and gotten lost, potentially due to some kind of medical event. The area where he disappeared was heavily wooded, and there were several streams and small lakes nearby. However, this theory seemed unlikely because as far as I can tell, Chris was experienced in the outdoors and was familiar with the area given he was working there. Additionally, searchers had scoured the area extensively and found no signs of Chris. Despite the lack of evidence and leads, Chris's family continued to search for answers themselves. They set up a website to help spread awareness about Chris's case, and they offered a reward for information leading to his whereabouts. They also hired a private investigator to look into the case. Over the years, several possible sightings of Chris have been reported, but none of them were ever confirmed. In 2012, a group of volunteers organised a search of the area where Chris disappeared, but they found no new evidence. Today, over 20 years since Chris vanished, his case remains unexplained. His family continues to hold out hope that someday they'll find out what happened to him they've never given up this search. Ultimately, Chris was never found despite extensive searches and investigations. No evidence has ever been found to shed light on what happened. There is unfortunately a frustrating lack of information and understanding of this next disappearance, but it is most certainly deserving of being brought up again. Philip Arendt, who was 42 years old at the time, was reported missing by his brother on the 7th of September 2005 in the park. The pair of them were on a multi-day hiking trip which began at Mineral King and it was supposed to end there too after completing a loop. Now, during this hike, Philip began to feel unwell and the pair hiked and came out at a different trailhead. At this point, Philip's brother told him to stay put right there while he hitchhiked a ride back to where the car was parked so he could swing back around pick up Philip and then drive them both home. Philip agreed and got comfortable with his backpack, which had supplies, including water, and this round trip for the brother would unfortunately take around five hours in total to make it back to Philip's location. When the brother finally got back, he realised that Philip just wasn't around anymore, and he began to poke into the forest calling for him, but not once did he ever receive a reply. As far as I can tell also, there wasn't anyone else present, just the pair of them before Philip was alone for five hours. Initial searches near Crescent Meadow, the area in which Philip was last seen by his brother, were narrowed down to a point off the Sugar Pine Trail after search teams located the missing man's sunglasses, said Alexandra Picavet of the National Park Service. The area has heavy vegetation and steep embankments, making search conditions difficult, she said. More than 40 ground searchers, mounted patrol, a dog team, employees and volunteers combed the area for days along with the aid of a helicopter crew. Philip's body was found late Saturday at the bottom of a steep embankment near Crescent Creek, less than a mile from the Crescent Meadow parking area. Officials believe he may have passed away due to exposure. The article then went on to explain that officials had absolutely no idea why Philip left the area. While the cause of passing wasn't completely clear, and an official conclusion was never published by the press, it is likely that it was down to exposure, given that his body was found three days after the date of disappearance, and, I assume, had seemingly sustained no injuries or that would have been mentioned, and the cause a little more obvious if a fall or something like that had taken place. Now, what is odd about this is why Philip felt the need to move in the first place. You have a situation in which Philip was sat comfortably waiting for his brother. He had supplies, shade, water, 
and he felt unwell, so it's hard to imagine that all of a sudden he wanted to go on some long solo hike. Yet still, for some unknown reason that the authorities could never determine, he decided it best to move out from this spot into the rugged, hazardous and steep surrounding areas away from the trail. Why? There was no other press reports that I could find about this, but it certainly seems like a piece of information is missing here. Given that they found his sunglasses, it also seems like he began to abandon items, or perhaps was moving a little too quickly and dropped them. That also seems like it warrants a conversation. Could he have been afraid? He dropped them and didn't bother retrieving them, which means that in that moment, it just wasn't important. Was there another presence nearby that essentially made him feel uncomfortable and perhaps not so physically pushed him away from the car park and into a more remote area to get away? This is interesting because it's unlikely to have been an animal in this instance because there would have been clear evidence upon finding the body if that were the case. Instead, we have a situation where this man was found, I'm assuming uninjured given the description by authorities to the press. I have no doubt, as is the suggestion, that after a while he became lost and then later expired due to exposure. But that does not seem like the whole story. He got up and moved for a reason that was never determined. Again, it seems to me that there's a missing piece of information here, and something that we don't know occurred in between the brother hitchhiking and driving back to his brother. His family described him as an avid backpacker and climber and loved ice climbing. He also liked canoeing, fishing and backpacking with his dog. So this was a man that was comfortable and experienced in the outdoors given he'd been doing his favourite activities for so long. That, sadly, is the end of the paper trail and there was barely any reporting on Philip, leaving us with another example of someone inexplicably and for seemingly no apparent reason leaving and disappearing into the forest. What happened here? On the 29th of April 2005, Japan was celebrating Greenery Day, which is a national holiday to show appreciation of nature. This would be the day that five-year-old Yuki Onishi vanished under very unusual circumstances in Kagawa's Goshikidai Forest, where around 60 people that day were celebrating. This group of people were attending a bamboo root digging event in which from what I can tell, some people in Asia enjoy boiling and eating. In any case, Yuki showed up with her mother and eight-year-old sister that day and together they began looking for these roots to dig up. Not long into the event, Yuki found her first bamboo root and told her mother that she was going to go and find another and walked away alone. In this moment, the family went from spending time together and digging up the bamboo to sheer panic when the mother realised that she could no longer see Yuki. Sadly, it was 20 minutes from when Yuki wandered away to the mother scanning the area but realising she couldn't see her anywhere. All 60 of the event goers were quickly mobilised and began to search the area and this continued from around 1.50pm to 3pm at which time law enforcement was called and arrived on scene. Many volunteers were also called in and firefighters also got involved in the search, placing hundreds of people now inside the Goshikidai forest, all looking for Yuki. This was a rapid response all things considered with the unfortunate 20 minute delay at the start, but despite the area being flooded, there was just no indication of Yuki anywhere. This initial search on the day of the disappearance went on for around six hours when the authorities arrived before being escalated quickly. It seems that the authorities knew right away how ridiculous the situation was in terms of not being able to find a trace of her anywhere, and it seems that they knew it just didn't make sense. As I'm sure you can imagine, people began speculating as to what happened, and many people believed that a third party must have been involved. And in all fairness, you can see why people might have been drawn to that conclusion. However, something weird happened. Here are some direct quotes from Japanese press outlets that were collected on a Japanese blog. This is translated, and I've had to alter some of it slightly to have it translate well, but I've kept it intact as close to the original writing as I can. The mother said that there were other family members around, and it was a place she could hear voices, so she allowed Yuki to go. There were two witnesses who saw Yuki separate from her mother. 
One of them was a junior high school girl who had a conversation with Yuki. The other was a man looking down on the south side from the pavilion and saw Yuki walking at 1.40pm. Until 9pm, the police, firefighters and volunteers searched the bamboo forest and the mountain forest but found no clues. Police dogs smelled Yuki's water bottle and were able to follow her scent, but the police dogs stopped in their tracks and stopped moving in an open space in the bamboo forest. Other police dogs stopped at the same spot and stopped following the trail. Get this. It's like a movement that would have to have been lifted straight up by a helicopter or something. The authorities noted at the time that if Yuki had been taken on foot in that moment, the dog should have been able to continue following the scent to her, but this of course did not happen. They also made the point that if their dogs had found another scent there, human or animal, they would have likely followed it. I'm not sure exactly how they would have known that, but they're trained to use these dogs effectively, and so they know more about it than I do. I suppose perhaps the new scent would have been mixed with Yuki's and allowed them to follow, I'm not sure. Also of importance here is that there was no road, it's not like this clearing in the forest was connected to a spot in which a vehicle could have been sat there, and no one heard anything either. It was as if something picked a perfect time to act. Whatever happened with Swift left no trace behind and there were no signs of a disturbance, and no sounds of something taking place either. The blog continues. The police took the dogs further into the forest, but even after thoroughly searching the forest on the north side, they could still not find a scent. Yuki's last sighting was when she was walking south from where her mother was, but even after the dogs searched that area, there was no trace of her after the clearing. Some believed that she may have fallen into a hole or into a pond, but the police said that their dogs would have found that hole and if there was a hole that a person could have fallen into, one of the 3,000 people that searched this forest would have found it. Black bears are known to be around this area, but it is unlikely that Yuki had been exposed to a bear, because these bears leave footprints and there would have been drag marks. Considering that Yuki's scent is interrupted in the middle of a forest, it might be more likely to state that a large bird or an animal that crosses a tree might have taken her, but there are no monkeys or chimps in this forest. It's interesting that they bring up the idea of a large bird causing some kind of aerial disappearance. It's not the first time this kind of thing has been brought up. Now, the sheriff said something interesting. Instead of disappearing on foot, the sheriff begins to contemplate a disappearance from above. I could go along with the possibility that he could have been taken by an eagle but it's difficult to accept the boy's disappearance by either a bear or a cougar, said the sheriff. The articles then go on to briefly discuss eagles and falcons, but the authorities determined that even their largest of eagles there would not have been able to fly away with Yuki in tow. As far as the black bear was concerned, I would actually go slightly further than the writers here and state that never mind just drag marks or animal tracks near this clearing, if a black bear had been involved here, there would have been clear signs of animal predation. That is the type of evidence left behind that you simply cannot miss, as frankly, and without trying to be descriptive, it's very messy. As someone who writes about these disappearances quite often, I've seen a few of these kinds of scenes now, and honestly, I'd prefer that I hadn't seen them. I also think in that scenario, the dogs would have led them right to the spot, because of these lines of thought that we're exploring, many people believed that it was more likely that she had been taken by a third party. In trying to come up with a way in which the scent might have been completely cut off, it seems that the only reasonable suggestion is that perhaps she could have been placed inside of something, a bag or something similar. Of course, there's also no evidence of that at all, and you think that a sound might have been heard if that had gone down though I'm not actually sure what else could make sense here. Others believed that she might have fallen into the nearby pond, but that was drained and nothing was found in there. The final suggestion was that she simply went too far into the forest and got lost. While certainly possible, and to some, might even have been the most likely scenario, 
The fact that the dogs couldn't follow her scent past the clearing suggests to me quite strongly that something happened right there. It also seems that the articles were pointing in that direction also. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. That was also the end of the paper trail, so let's now go further back in time. It was late April 1922 when two-year-old Pauline Picard disappeared from her family's farm in the village of Goasaluda, located in the Brittany region of northwest France. Every parent's worst nightmare was realised as she was playing on the grass just by the home, and when her parents came to check on her, she was nowhere to be found. The Picards were said to be absolutely frantic, and they raced to reach people to help search. They had many members of law enforcement on the scene, and over 150 people in the local communities who dropped everything to come and help search for her. The farmlands, fields, surrounding woods and countryside were all scoured for any sign of Pauline, but they just couldn't find any trace of her anywhere. Law enforcement tried to come up with a list of hypotheses as to what happened, and they concluded that the most likely scenario was that she had wandered off from the farm and succumbed to the elements. In order to explain why there was no trace of her anywhere, law enforcement reasoned that after this, the remains may have been eaten by an animal. The parents didn't seem to be on board with this though, as the problem was that she'd vanished so quickly outside on that morning that they just didn't believe that a two-year-old could get so far away so quickly. A couple of weeks had passed, and the Picards received word that a two-year-old girl matching Pauline's description had been found wandering alone in Cherbourg, 217 miles away. This was a bizarre turn of events for everyone involved, because after the parents had seen the pictures that were taken of this girl, they were absolutely sure that it was Pauline. After arriving in Cherbourg and spending hours with her, they said that she wasn't behaving normally and didn't seem to recognise them. The family felt that Pauline had just gone through a lot, blocked everything out and needed some time to readjust and to feel safe again. So off they went home, hoping that Pauline's memory would return and that she could explain to them exactly what happened. The neighbours and the other Picard children came to greet Pauline and they all recognised her, and life returned to normal with a sense of relief in the air. Things were different though. The other kids at the farm noted that she was quite fearful and very shy, where before she was not. Pauline's parents continued to attribute this to the experience that she must have gone through. Though curiously, no one had any good ideas as to how she travelled over 200 miles and law enforcement didn't seem to provide any great explanations for this either. I suppose the only way that you can try to reason this away is by offering that perhaps someone had planned to take Pauline on the day of her disappearance, got as far as Shabor, and then changed their mind. I don't really know how likely something like this is, but I don't see any other alternative here to make that make sense. Though it was weeks after she disappeared that she was discovered in Shabor, so it's difficult to say how the parents might have been reasoning this between themselves. I couldn't find any quotes or statements from the parents on this specifically. Things got somewhat strange on the farm over the course of the next few weeks because the parents stated that Pauline was getting better and becoming herself again. But the more time that went on, like the other kids it seems, began to question if this girl really was their daughter. As is often the case in these kinds of disappearances that we cover on the channel, things would take another bizarre turn. In the meantime, the Picards were now very confused about this whole incident. It seems to me that while this girl did in fact look exactly like Pauline, as practically everyone had stated and agreed, I think that the parents desperately wanted her to be Pauline. Their world would come crashing down on the 27th of May, approximately a whole month after a date of disappearance. This next part is reported differently depending on the source, but the outcome is the same. Some outlets report that a farmer found Pauline's body, while others state that it was a cyclist. Now, the problem being here is that she was discovered only 800 yards away from the farm, 
law enforcement who organised the search had absolutely no idea how she could have been missed. And again, frustratingly, no offers of an explanation seemed to be forthcoming. To be clear, the body was in a state of decomposition, but Pauline's clothing had been folded neatly right next to her. This included the dress and socks, but the shoes were missing. While it wasn't stated specifically, this has to have been a huge point of contention and confusion for law enforcement, and is probably why they didn't have much of an explanation to begin with. At first, people felt that she might have passed away due to the elements, and then perhaps a wild boar had gotten to the remains. However, that doesn't explain the clothing at all, and also, locals in the area swore blind that they had searched that exact spot numerous times throughout the duration of the search, and she wasn't there. It's important to detail something here. When the remains were discovered, authorities noted that a head was found nearby, but was too big for the body, and thus, it was realised that there were two victims here. French officials got involved now, and formally collated all of the details that had transpired so far, including the fact that the villagers had said that they searched that exact spot over and over again during the search effort, people began to suspect that someone wanted the body to be found. While I'm not sure who performed the autopsy, what's particularly saddening is that Dr. Garreau would later study the remains as part of the autopsy or had permission afterwards, and he believed that he'd found signs of something bad happening in terms of third party involvement. However, it's important to note that the autopsy itself didn't actually provide any conclusive evidence. And there were two parties, again, one that believed that the cause of passing was down to something terrible, and others who believed it was accidental and caused by exposure. That is quite bizarre honestly, and frankly confusing. I'm not sure how Dr. Garreau believed he'd found evidence on the body of something particularly sinister, but then it provided no conclusive evidence either way. That's somewhat confusing, and also, from what I'm able to ascertain, it seems that many people believed it was down to exposure, even after finding what looks to have been a second victim in the same spot as Pauline was found. I'm not actually sure what was going on there. In fact, the judge, formerly in charge of the investigation, determined that Pauline's passing was accidental. I have no idea if there were those who just wanted to sweep this under the rug or what, but those are some wildly varying and frankly, contradictory causes. Things got weird again, with some articles seeming to suggest that perhaps the body was not Pauline's and the girl in the Picard's care was actually Pauline, but that seems unlikely. And now, questions about who this girl actually was arose. No one ever came forth to claim that she was their daughter, but she would be placed in care and then passed away two years afterwards due to an outbreak of measles. I'm not sure how you find the evidence of the remains left behind in the field, come to the conclusion that there were two victims, have Dr. Garreau, who believes he'd found evidence of something perhaps quite terrible, and then come to the conclusion that she must have succumbed to the elements. That just seems very odd to me, what do you think? Yehudi Pryor was two years old when he disappeared from Vancouver Island in Canada while out during a berry picking trip with his family. The Pryors lived in a cabin near Wild Deer Lake and the berry patch was only a short distance away from the home. This was an odd incident because he and his family were interacting and having fun all day while out in the berry bushes. But at around 3pm on the 23rd of September 1974, his parents realised that they hadn't heard him for around 5 minutes but each thought that he was with the other just a short distance away. It seems that the father made his way over to his wife, which is where they realised that Yehudi had vanished. There wasn't an immediate panic, though I'm sure that the pair became nervous as they began searching and poking around the bushes. But all they could hear was an absolute silence apart from the wind. They called out for Yehudi and walked around the general area they had all just been together, but they never received a reply, nor saw anything to indicate where it might have gone, or what might have happened. Using a police tracking dog from Nanimo, 
The Royal Canadian Mounted Police searched fruitlessly until Dark Tuesday for Yehudi, who was with his parents on a berry picking excursion when he disappeared. Aside from the accidental pun there, when the dogs arrived, they initially picked up his scent, but weren't able to follow it from the area. I also find this a little bit questionable. At about 3pm Monday, the parents realised Yehudi had disappeared. They conducted their own search of the area until after dark and notified the Shawnigan Lake RCMP department just before midnight. That, to me, seems like an absolutely awful decision that they would hold off calling the authorities until over 9 hours after the initial disappearance. It's difficult to understand how that even happened. What should have happened is straight after the initial failed search effort, the authorities should have been notified straight away. RCMP officers and a group of volunteers Saturday continued their search in Rough Bush near Shawnigan Lake. The authorities said the hunt continued throughout the day, but failed to turn up any sign of Yehudi. The search began on Tuesday, and by Thursday had as many as 65 volunteers taking part. Six tracking dogs and an RCMP helicopter were also used in the search. At this point, suspicions began to grow that Yehudi had been taken from the area. Authorities seemed to believe that these tracking dogs had picked up Yehudi's scent at the berry picking site so they knew he'd been there, but they couldn't figure out how or where he'd gone after this. The parents said that they thought that they heard a car stop nearby a logging road not far from their cabin. The only problem with this though is that there wasn't a line of sight between the family and the logging road, so even if someone had stopped there, they wouldn't have known if there was anyone even in the bushes at that time. This idea was quickly dismissed because in the next article, published three days after the last, this was stated. The unclothed body of Yehudi was found Sunday afternoon after a six day search in the rugged bushland west of Shawnigan Lake. Yehudi had apparently passed away due to fatigue and cold the night of the 23rd which was the day of the disappearance. His body was found about four miles from where he went missing. This introduced a point of confusion because search leaders weren't sure how he'd managed to travel four miles in such a short time span in this rugged terrain. But this idea of being taken by someone else was ruled out because other than fine scratches all over his body, he hadn't sustained any injuries. Secondly, and this wasn't brought up again, but why weren't the dogs able to find and follow his scent in this instance? It seems that initially, this added to the idea that he had been removed from the area, thus giving the dogs nothing to follow. When Yehudi was found, he had removed his t-shirt and shoes, though it's not clear if he'd removed the shoes with his family before disappearing. According to the search leaders, Yehudi had wandered off over a small ridge into a valley and headed to Holt Creek. He said that footprints were found in the area and they petered out, but gave them a focal point to search and after fanning out in the area, they found his body in a shallow pool beside the creek. Interestingly, after this event took place, the leader of the Conservative Party at the time, Dr. Scott Wallace demanded a full explanation as to what happened here. This was provoked by two other instances alongside Yehudi in which young people had passed away due to apparent neglect. But he effectively said that the public must be provided with a full explanation as to what happened in these instances and pointed to this case because it was less clear as to what happened. Yehudi's case was different to the other two being referred to because there was no real evidence to point in any direction other than he just wandered off, but there were many people that were sceptical about him travelling 4 miles in such a short time span and why he wasn't found sooner. It seems that Dr Wallace's words may have had an effect here because towards the end of the month of October, Yehudi's autopsy was reported by the press. The autopsy revealed that Yehudi was well nourished and well built. Corporal Herbert Schmidt of Shawnigan Lake said there were numerous fine scratches all over the body. There was no evidence of decomposition, no food in the stomach, 
and the findings are consistent with exposure. Two constables who conducted investigations after finding the body indicated there was no evidence of foul play. There were a few odd things though. Schmidt said he told Pryor that a search would begin immediately. He testified that Pryor said he did not believe a search was necessary, that he felt Yehudi was alright and he would make the search himself. Next day, at 11.45am, Pryor returned and said that he couldn't find his son. The body was found approximately 150 feet from a gravel logging road in a densely wooded area with no trail between the road and the place the body was found. A picture showed that the head was above the waterline. The body was lying in a pool of water approximately 5 inches deep with a temperature of 47 degrees. That was the end of the paper trail. It's odd that the father initially felt a search wasn't necessary despite the fact that Yehudi had been missing for 9 hours alone in what was now cold and rugged terrain. It's also odd that Yehudi would enter the small body of water the way it seems he must have, and that the dogs weren't able to follow the scent away from the berry picking site. While there was no evidence that another person had been involved here, it seems that many people simply didn't believe that. The Pryor family ended up moving home, though a reason wasn't given as to why. Perhaps now awful memories, and potentially a community that may have been suspicious, it's not made clear. Nor was it made clear what some may have felt the alternative explanation was, but it sure seems that waiting as long as the father did before reporting it, and then saying that he was going to search alone, can't have helped one bit. In any case, I can see why Dr. Wallace demanded a full explanation of this disappearance. What are your thoughts? Now, let's talk about Richard Tom Sudden, who was three years old when he disappeared from their rural home around 10 miles north of the small town of Covalo in California. Richard was playing in the garden with their family dog when this took place. It's not clear what happened in the moments leading up to the disappearance, but let's have a look at an article released by the press at the time. Sheriff's deputies directed military and civilian groups in a search through Wild Sierra Country for Richard. Late Thursday, the lad's dog, a constant companion, came home. One of the boy's mittens was found a quarter mile from the house on a steep hillside. Searchers said they could hardly believe that the child could have climbed to the ledge. So, things get interesting right off the bat, because first of all, Richard and his dog went missing at the same time, with the dog coming home many hours later, alone. Richard's mitten was also found in an area that all involved came to the conclusion that he cannot possibly have reached alone. The only problem, which we'll get to in a moment, was the fact that there was absolutely no evidence at all that would indicate that a third party took him. Searchers found footprints which might be those of Richard, who disappeared three days ago in the wild mining country of the Sierra Nevadas. The prints were relatively fresh, the searchers said, and led to a ravine about half a mile from Richard's summer home. The family dog sniffed at the footprints, followed them a short distance, and then stopped confused. The prints were near the spot where one of Richard's red and blue mittens was found by one of the 200 persons trampling the woods and hills for sight of him. Although some relatives feared that the lad may have been taken, officials and the boy's mother did not hold to that theory. District Attorney Alfred R. Lowy said there is nothing in my mind to support the idea that he had been taken by a third party this is just a lost child. The sheriff then came forth and stated the exact same thing. And there does seem to be good reason for this. Richard's footprints were completely alone. Now, it's easy enough to say that Richard just got lost. However, no one present could propose a decent explanation for any of these factors. Other tracking dogs came in too and they also could not follow the scent of the fresh prints that seemingly led to a ravine and disappeared. Because the prints were fresh, this must have meant that Richard was getting around and somehow at the same time managing to evade the hundreds of people who were out looking for him. 
After repeated searches of the ravine failed, a couple of Russian shepherd dogs were brought in who, according to the Modesto Bee and News Herald, had been involved in the finding of almost 100 lost persons, and their handlers were confident that they would find Richard, given the evidence that was left behind. Needless to say at this point, but despite the accolades given to these dogs, they too were just as confused as the family dog, who could follow the scent no further. It's as if the scent just suddenly ended at the ravine. These searches would meet their unsuccessful conclusion and were brought to a stop when no further evidence could be found. The FBI ended up becoming interested in this disappearance and they began to investigate it privately. But as far as I can tell, this never led to any form of conclusion. This whole incident is just bizarre when you start to think about it, because days into the search, the searchers found the fresh prints. So if Richard had been taken by a third party, what were they doing sticking around for days afterwards in an area filled with hundreds of people searching? That doesn't really make much sense. That seems to have spurred on the comments from the sheriff and others who stated that Richard was lost as opposed to taken. I'm not sure what was going on with the prints and the dogs either. This was never expanded upon. We're practically at the end of the paper trail now and despite all this time afterwards, Richard was never found. It was a cold, foggy morning when Judy Rodenkarl, 16 years old, disappeared from rural Washera County in Wisconsin. Judy lived with her parents in a remote farmhouse in the small town of Auroraville. This day though, right at the very end of October 1956 would be like no other and something unusual would take place on the Rodenkal family farm. That morning, like all others, Judy would get up early and prepare herself for school that day, but for some reason she would never make it to the school bus, nor school. Officers turned out with volunteers today in an aircraft led search for Judy. Described by the sheriff's office as a nice, quiet girl with a steady boyfriend. The boyfriend, who was not identified, helped spare the search Tuesday night when he arrived at the farmhouse. The sheriff's office reported that Judy left her home for school that morning, but did not get on the school bus. She later was seen about noon near her home. From what I'm able to ascertain, that sighting wasn't confirmed I don't believe. Just that someone thought they saw Judy, so it's not completely clear if it was her or not. A couple of questions immediately entered the minds of the sheriff. Firstly, the question as to whether this might have been purposeful arose. The family had stated that she was in great spirits and seemed excited for school that day, and her boyfriend said something similar to the effect of her seeming happy. After these statements were made, the sheriff's office immediately realised that something wasn't right here and began to suspect foul play. But after searching the heavily wooded and swampy areas surrounding the farmhouse, they hadn't uncovered any evidence of this. But the sheriff said that that was the theory that they were proceeding the investigation with. Now, the first day of searching uncovered nothing, but the second day would reveal something odd. The investigation into the mysterious disappearance of Judy Rodenkarl reached an impasse today as officers sought new leads. Willow Creek was dragged, but no evidence of her presence was found. The dragging operators were confined to the east side of Highway 49, where bloodhounds late Wednesday led the officers. The creek, which is generally shallow on that side of the highway, was dragged for about half a mile. The bloodhounds led officers to the bridge over the creek after giving a scent from two socks identified as belonging to Judy. The socks and a handkerchief were found Wednesday about a mile north and west of the Rodenkarl home. The authorities went on to state that these items showed no signs of foul play, but they also had absolutely no idea what was even happening here. The bloodhounds led the searchers to the socks nearby this body of water, but then the trail went cold and the dogs could no longer follow a scent. They sat down and became uninterested at that spot. This obviously led to the dragging of Willow Creek, but as said, it became clear that she wasn't in there. 
it seems that a lot of hope was placed on the dogs here, but they weren't able to track her any further. So, for some reason that isn't clear, Judy travelled over a mile from her home and then removed her shoes and socks, but the shoes were never located. What was even going on there? What's particularly interesting about this too, is that no one seemed to have any idea what was going on. Some people were sticking to the idea that foul play was involved, while others just didn't know and thought this finding was odd. The air of mystery surrounding this incident would end up inviting many additional people to help search. Huge crowds of curious spectators jammed the village last Wednesday afternoon and evening. This morning, scores of cars were seen in the village, but there was no organised search and Officer Fritz said he did not know of any plans for additional searches unless some new leads were received. The bloodhounds were brought in from La Crosse, handled by their owner, Twice, they followed the same route from the spot where the socks were found to the side of the creek just east of the bridge. It was at that spot that they became uninterested, whatever that means. Presumably just sitting down and not being able to find the scent again. Or, I suppose, was sat at the end of the scent trail, though I'm not sure how that makes any sense here considering she wasn't in the water. It's also strange that the search was reaching its conclusion so early, but it was stated that this entire area now had been scoured by hundreds of people and she just wasn't there. Now, if we wasn't there already, let's get bizarre. Judy, missing for nearly 60 hours, stumbled out of the woods and fell unconscious at the door of a farmhouse Thursday night. Judy was found by farmer Edgar Tim as he walked from the barn to his home. He summoned authorities who brought her to hospital. Her physician, Dr. David Sievers, said that she was in good condition but suffering from shock and exposure. Police said Judy was unable to answer questions when she reached the hospital and there was no information on how she had spent the hours since she disappeared. That is simply bizarre. Judy stumbled out of the woods, which had already been thoroughly searched fell unconscious and had no memory at all of her time spent missing. The sheriff stated that it appeared that she was alone for the entire time that she'd vanished. He also tried to explain away the incident by stating that she might have spent the entire time in an outbuilding on Edgar's farm, though I'm not sure how you could possibly know that since there was no evidence that was the case, nor could she remember anything. What was interesting too was the fact that she was found barefoot and her shoes were never found. They weren't in Willow Creek, they weren't anywhere on Edgar's farm. The repeated searches of the wooded areas didn't uncover them, and the dogs couldn't find them either. Good actual lord, what even happened here? This whole ordeal is just creepy and weird. No one had any great answers here, what do you think? Now, let's talk about an unusual incident that occurred in a remote area on the outskirts of Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. It was an Easter Sunday when Jimmy Sensor, who was four years old at the time, would disappear from his home, or more specifically, from his garden. On that day, the 6th of April 1947, Jimmy's parents were inside the home with other family members as dinner was being prepared. That left Jimmy and two of his siblings, who were five and seven years old, playing in the garden together. Now, at some point, Dinner had been finished and they were calling the young ones inside and everyone but Jimmy came in. The parents realised immediately and asked his brother and sister where he was but they had no idea. They said that they didn't even realise he was missing. As far as I can tell, it looks like Jimmy was doing his own thing in the garden. When his parents went outside to check for him, they found his shoes in the garden but Jimmy was nowhere to be seen. Jimmy was missing today on the wild, windswept mountains of central Pennsylvania, and where researchers feared that he might already have passed away due to exposure. Hundreds of searchers, armed with lanterns and flashlights, braved the icy blasts to continue their search through the night. After the disappearance, the only clues to date have been a small red sweater, found on a railroad track near his home and several footprints of his bare feet in the mud. 
Now, Jimmy's sweater was found 500 yards away from the house and his footprints were in that area too and led to a waterhole which was apparently formed by coal stripping operations in the past. The authorities said that the area he'd ventured out to was particularly treacherous and even more so after the coal mining operations. I'm sure that you can imagine, but at the start of this search, there were those who believed that foul play might have been involved here and someone might have taken Jimmy. However, what's interesting is that Jimmy's bare footprints were completely alone meaning that there was no evidence of anyone else being around. So, after finding the prints, that idea was largely dispelled. However, there was something else that wasn't adding up. With hundreds of people now flooding the area, search leaders believed that Jimmy would be located swiftly. But as it turned out, they couldn't have been any further from the truth. It's important to note firstly, that the prints and the sweater were found on the first day of the search. After fanning out in all directions from that point, the search had completely failed to look at anything else. And after leaving the searchers stumped, they brought in bloodhounds to shine a light on just what had happened here. The bloodhound was given the sweater and brought to Jimmy's footprints. Yesterday, a bloodhound from Rockview Penitentiary was put into the hunt but failed to uncover any trace of the child. All waterholes in the area are being dragged by searching parties. Jimmy wasn't in any of the waterholes, and bizarrely, despite having direct evidence that Jimmy seems to have been alone and in that very area, bloodhounds could not find his scent at all. This was odd, and now left the searchers in a situation where they knew that he had to have been close because the temperatures were cold. And given that he was four, he shouldn't have been able to get very far in these conditions and in the rough terrain. The search for Jimmy practically started immediately after the disappearance too, with his parents and family searching, followed by people flooding the area after it had been reported. Here are a couple of quotes from an article published three days after the disappearance and just highlights how odd this whole ordeal was. One of the largest manhunts ever organized in this area continued relentlessly today as searchers refused to give up hopes of finding Jimmy. Red-eyed, weary searchers stumbled out of the mountain section in the dawn after an all-night search for the second consecutive night and were rapidly replaced by scores of fresh volunteers. First of all, this was a search that basically never ceased operations and there were constantly people all over that mountain. Floodlights had been set up all over the place with the use of fire trucks and each person obviously had a flashlight. An estimated 1,000 searchers scattered over the mine pocketed terrain yesterday in the hunt and half dozen airplanes circled low over the area looking for the small figure. So, around 1,000 people could not find Jimmy, and this wasn't just on day one either. Around 1,000 people kept showing up day after day to search. This massive effort went on for 10 days and Jimmy, nor any trace of him, would ever be found. For whatever reason, he seemed to have removed his shoes that day and then walked away from the home alone and vanished. He was never found. The search concluded with this statement, J. L. Ulmholtz of Sandy Ridge, who directed the major part of the large-scale search, stated that if the boy had been in the area covered, we would have found him. That is a very interesting statement, and you could hardly blame the searchers, but clearly, it seems that many will have been suspicious about this, thinking that he wasn't even in the area anymore. How that may have came to be was never made clear and wasn't expanded upon. These thoughts were disrupted by the authorities too, who went on to say that there was absolutely no evidence to indicate that Jimmy had been taken. Though they didn't really provide a great explanation as to what had happened, only stating that they believe he walked off and got lost. Though I agree with Ulmholtz, it's hard to imagine he was still there after a thousand searchers scoured the area day after day and finding no trace of him. What do you think? Now, it's time to end this video and hand it over to you in the comments below. I'd just like to take the time to thank you for watching and a big thank you to the patrons who've been running around on the screen. 
If you found the video interesting, then please do leave a like, hit the bell, and subscribe if you haven't already. If not, then feel free to leave a dislike, I'm just looking for your honest opinion either way. I hope that you've had a great day, or evening, depending on where you are, and I'll see you in the next one. Be safe guys, peace.